evening and welcome to another hedonistic flurry of inky pleasure. In the news this week, as he retires from politics, Cecil Parkinson auditions for the remake of Chariots of Fire. <laughs> <laughs> There's embarrassment at Ascot as a dozen women all turn up in the same hat. <laughs> and in Rochdale, having invested in a new penthouse suite for his retirement, uh, Cyril Smith lies down to sunbathe on his roof terrace. <laughs> On uh, Ian Hislop's team, the man who made Whose Line Is It Anyway what it is today, full of Americans, <laughs> John Sessions. <laughs> and our other guest this week is someone who's interviewed Saddam Hussein and come face to face with Colonel Gaddafi, so he'll feel quite at home sitting next to Paul Merton, <laughs> Trevor MacDonald. <laughs> So let's uh, trickle slowly into round one. Four bits of crafty camera work to consider. What's the story they're illustrating? Ian and John, where is she and why? Um, she's being Florence Nightingale. She's visiting Paul Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> she's, uh, oh, she's Dennis's nightcap. Dennis, <laughs> Dennis's nightcap, yep. I think she went to the Falklands because it's the only place they haven't heard she's not Prime Minister yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is. It's, uh, it's Mrs. Thatcher who's uh, in the Falkland Islands to mark the 10th anniversary of her victory over the crack squads of Argentine teenagers, uh, <laughs> where she was uh, greeted by the islanders with cries of, Welcome home, Maggie, if only. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the official car of Governor William Fullerton is, in fact, a London cab. At least uh, his driver can't bore him with the usual cabby conversation. Guess who I had in the back of my cab the other day? <laughs> Me? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Port, uh, Port Stanley is now expanding rapidly thanks to an economic boom. The town now even has a red light district. Someone's tied a sheep to a lamppost. <laughs> uh, Paul and Trevor, more British ambassadors abroad for you. Uh, this is Royal Family and Show of Unity. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think we, we know... We know oh. about this one. This is a... Well, there's, there's David Mellor. I'm just an ordinary bloke who can't play football. <laughs> our, our football supporters have a great love for the game and a great love for foreigners. And they went to Sweden, and there were the Swedes sort of opening up these... Uh, with a singular lack of good grace, giving them free beer or cheap drink. Mm. It was very, very bad. I think it's a really dirty trick of Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> they, you know, they open up these beer tents and then they, they say, These people are drunk. <laughs> Drinking beer. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, it's the chaos and misery caused by a small minority of English halfwits, and things were even worse off the pitch. <laughs> um, <laughs> In uh, true liberal style, the Swedish authorities welcomed the English fans with open arms and erected a beer tent which sold only 2% proof beer. Although, for anyone used to getting drunk on Skull Lager, that's like fire water. <laughs> uh, Ian and John, yes. a military mm. tale for you. Mm. Uh, this is Frank Sinatra bidding farewell to Count Basie when he set off <laughs> around the world. That's the Gay Gordons. <laughs> no. That's Ian McKellen selling double glazing to <laughs> John Major. That's Britain's top lovey. A top lovey. That's a <laughs> one-up on sessions, even. Yeah. Amazingly. <laughs> yes. Lovey meaning actor. Yes, he's bringing a makeup kit along to teach John Major how to do the kabuki version of King Lear. <laughs> Which I think John would be very good at, actually. Ooh, yeah, Once he's well taken some it. acid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a story about homosexuality in the armed forces. Yeah. It is which is now no longer compulsory. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. No longer illegal. Yes. yes. You have to leave the forces, hmm. but they don't lock you in a cell and feed you on dried hmm. wheat. Or whatever they do. <laughs> wheat. <Yes. laughs> I think that's Sorry. barbaric <laughs> feeding people on dried <laughs> wheat. <laughs> We're one of the last countries in Europe yeah. to do that. <laughs> that's right. Yes, I, I think... Uh, I don't know. I think we're straying slightly from the answer. But that's basically it, it is, isn't it? Basically yeah. it. Yeah. It's uh, the decision by the government to no longer regard homosexuality in the armed forces as a criminal offence. So there'll be some relieved privates around. <laughs> <laughs> the decision is also seen by some Tory backbenchers as the thin end of the wedge. And there's no one who knows more about what you can get up to with the thin end of the wedge <laughs> than a Tory backbencher. 
Go on, Trevor. Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe. Oh, um. <laughs> Is this, um, oh. <laughs> It wasn't on the issue, was it, about, about this, um, about whether Japan, um, Japanese soldiers could take part in, in conflicts abroad. I mean, there was a great fuss about the fact that Japanese didn't contribute any soldiers to the Gulf War. The thing, the thing which... They sent a lot of radios, though. They sent a lot of radios. <laughs> 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 Harmless enough? Yeah. Yes, in their defence, a government spokesman said the dispatch of troops overseas would help Japan play a full role in international affairs. I think that's what the rest of us are worried about. <laughs> uh, communist MPs attempted to abort the vote by staging an ox walk, their version of a filibuster, where politicians <laughs> shuffle as slowly as possible to deliberately waste time, covering 20 yards in three and a half hours. <laughs> Anyone whose train leaves in five minutes and is trying to buy a ticket at King's Cross will know what it's like. <laughs> uh, so at the end of all that, well, uh, there would appear to be next to nothing in it, as both Ian and John and Paul and Trevor have a flawless four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Round two hovers expectantly round the corner, the only thing barring its way being our now virtually unremarkable caption competition. Each team has a photographic oddity laid before them. Ian and John, this is yours. <laughs> Paul and Trevor, yours is this. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, in the course of what we rather euphemistically refer to as the show, they have mm. to conjure up a caption or two. And while they're busy conjuring, let's prepare to do battle with the grubbier parts of the gutter press. Paul, tart watchdog, what's that all about? Um, it's not this woman in watchdog, that, that consumer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not her, the, uh, the great and good Linfold's Wood. Yes, yeah, it's no, not her. No, it isn't. No. <laughs> Um, it's not it, yes, this is where you, there's somebody set up, um, if you, you go to a prostitute and you don't get what you asked for, you can go and complain. <laughs> and you can get like, you know, two for the price of one or whatever. <laughs> so like, if you see a sign in a news agent that says French lessons or whatever, and you go there and she offers you technical drawing. <laughs> <laughs> then you... <laughs> Yeah. Or, or, or metal work, you know, yeah. you, can get your, you can get your money back. You can sue. I mean, yes. really, I, I think they should have a go at those 0898 numbers, because, I mean, they're, you know, they're seedy and they're always engaged as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's the National Watchdog Body Off Pro, uh, set up by Vice Queen Lindy, <laughs> Miss Whiplash St. Clair, uh, to monitor complaints against prostitutes. A bit like Oftel, except they deal with people complaining they're not getting dirty phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> You know, in, in, in Time Out, you're referred to as TV's Mr. Sex. <laughs> <laughs> I shall let the audience laugh to tell its own story. <laughs> I'll have you know, it costs a great deal of money to get that in. <laughs> in I'll fact... ask your money back if I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor, spot the deliberate mistake. Quail shows he knows his onions. I think this is a story about... Um, Dan Quayle. Um, he, he went to a school the other day and, um, and, and saw them doing this rather strange thing, which some, some jumped-up little kid told him was, was writing, and, and the word potato. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and Quayle said, um, I think you're, you're missing something off that word. And the little boy looked absolutely bemused by this, and Quayle went up to the blackboard and he, he put a little E on the oh. end of potato. <laughs> and... Um, and, I mean, the, it, it, there was a genuine problem. The vice president was a little out of his class. It was only a class for three-year-olds, you see. Yeah. <laughs> it is um, terrifying. If he ever had to spell potato in a crisis, what would happen? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh... Unthinkable. 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 It is unthinkable. It's, uh, it's a right, terrifying Trevor. thought. Very unthinkable. Uh, it is vice president <laughs> Dan Quayle. The Russians would walk through America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Eating all the potatoes. Better than Reagan. He didn't know what a potato was. <laughs> I thought you married one. <laughs> John, a curious scenario for you. Hmm. Dinner ladies TV ads. Well, this is the concern people have, is that the young people that die by want to eat on the street. You know, they don't want to have dinner um, at school, like, you know, with custard and so sponge puddings and stuff. So they're going to have sort of cool... Youth program people by <laughs> telling them that you got to eat your pink custard. And you're still trying to put in, man, right? You're not nowhere. 
and it um, is. Uh, it's the news is that, that true? yeah, it is. Yeah. It's astonishingly, <laughs> it's the news that uh, schools are to fork out up to seven and a half thousand pounds to advertise school meals on television in an effort to persuade more pupils to eat them. Alternatively, they could just make the meals nicer. <laughs> <laughs> Bit radical, but there we are. Uh, the commercial is to feature rap music with the hook line: "School dinners are cool dinners." Oh. Oh. Presumably, because they were cooked several days ago. <laughs> Um, uh, Ian, a medical tip for you. Patient was told to take shampoo by the spoonful. Uh, this is Elton John. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it worked. Terrific <laughs> success. No, it's about a man it's who was now. a fake doctor. Um, he posed as a doctor for years and years. Wasn't there um, one of the patients in court? Because uh, well, somebody had been uh, prescribed uh, suppositories and been told to swallow them. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> All of and that. He, yeah, yeah, and he said, you know, for all the good they did me, I might as well shut them up my arse. <laughs> Shame them. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, that was in the Daily Telegraph, wasn't it? <laughs> it is uh, Dr. Mohammed Saeed, who was uh, jailed for five years at Leeds Crown Court, having been posing as a GP since 1961. In the course of his deception, he prescribed laxatives instead of vitamin D tablets, uh, pills to be taken by the spoonful, uh, suppositories to be taken orally, creosote to be used as a throat spray, and urine stimulant pills to be taken just before bedtime. <laughs> sense uh, of humour, didn't he? <laughs> 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 Wasn't there thinking about, does it? Yeah. Uh, all of which marks an end to this round of uh, tall stories, and the definite trend that's beginning to set in is that uh, both teams seem to have exactly equal points. Paul and Trevor have eight, and Ian and John have a splendid eight. Mm. And so it's time to bask in reflected glory as we prepare to scale the dizzy heights of our monumental archive round. Each team is shown a moving testament to the art of location filming. Their job is to tell us what happened after the freeze. Ian and John, you're first. What is about to go on here is a vindictive attempt to placate the Prime Minister's pl political embarrassment and fury by seeking revenge. It's a man called Duncan Campbell. It is. And because he'd written some article in the New Statesman or tried to put some programme on the BBC, which very courageously they'd taken off um, <laughs> before it went on... Dif difficult to take it off after it had been on, in fact. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of truth in what I've got a touch of the Dan Quayles coming on. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, they, they um, raided his house. Yes, well, let's, uh, let's pull back and play. It was agreed he should open his own door, but the key wouldn't turn the lock. The officers were invited to try, but still it wouldn't budge. Heavier methods were called for. Oh, <laughs> it's not like this in the film, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it's the members of the special branch there, using all the restraint and guile for which they're rightly <laughs> overlooked, uh, trying unsuccessfully to force an entry into the house of Duncan Campbell to find tapes of his TV programme Zircon Shield. Incidentally, uh, if anyone from special branch is watching, all the tapes of this programme are kept in Jeremy Beadle's house. <laughs> <laughs> um, Paul and Trevor, yeah. <laughs> still on a televisual theme. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, my opponent is sitting here smoking. The smoke is going in my face. He's doing it in violation of D.C. fire laws. <laughs> there's, such a, there's such a sort of good-naturedness about the American anti-smoking lobby. Mm. I mean, they're so kind and gentle mm. that I would suspect that that man who was moving across to the smoker was about to give him one. <laughs> give him a <laughs> what? Gives him a cigarette. There's not much point, is there? A cigar. Isn't that an 0898 number? <laughs> we'll have a peek and see. He's doing it in violation of DC fire laws, so I'm putting it out because it is a violation of DC fire laws. No violence. Hold on, gentlemen. Gentlemen. Hold on. Self-defense, doctor. That was self-defense, doctor. No, gentlemen. Which one of them is going to be president? <laughs> Hopefully neither. Yes, it's a clip from uh, Nightwatch there, a late-night CBS debate show. Uh, looks of things are sort of crossed between Question Time and Tis Was, <laughs> in which uh, we saw Professor John Banza uh, throwing a glass of water over Professor Ernest van der Haag, who then demonstrated the calming effect of nicotine on human <laughs> behaviour. 
<laughs> so, uh, at the end of that histrionic round, <clears throat> uh, it gives me no pleasure at all to tell you that uh, Paul and Trevor have an anemic 10, and Ian and John have a ruddy 11. <laughs> Then we uh, proceed cautiously to our critically panned odd one out round, a bevy of beauties from which to choose one beast. Who are the Chippendales and who is the Derek Jameson? <laughs> uh, Paul, your chance uh, to show off your powers of pop luck. Uh, Yehudi Menuhin, Topol, the new Lord Archer, <laughs> making a surprise appearance, and Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Topol was known for uh, being in Fiddle on the Roof, that was his famous role, Fiddle on the Roof. Uh, you, Yehudi Menuhin, his violin work has dried up and he's now doing a lot of guttering and... and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and he's been charging exorbitant prices. Um, so that's where he's a fiddle on the roof. So off roof for looking um, into him, are they? Mm -hmm. um, Sherlock Holmes played um, the fiddle. This, it's Geoffrey Archer is the only one who doesn't play the violin. It is uh, Lord Archer, as all the others are fiddlers, whereas Archer has merely fiddled his expenses. <laughs> allegedly. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, some years ago, he had to return money to the UN Association, a charitable body, after it was reported in the press that no fewer than 69 of his expense claims had proved to be false. Despite this, he has continued to raise money for charity, although he claimed that his Simple Truth concert for the Kurds had raised over 57 million pounds, whereas the simple truth was that it had only raised four million pounds. <laughs> Easily confused. Uh, in his speech to the Kurds earlier this year, he tried to win them over by urging them to chant Biju Kurdistan, which he thought meant long live Kurdistan. This, in fact, would have been Bijit Kurdistan, Biju meaning bastard. <laughs> Strangely, uh, none of them joined in, but uh, they probably, probably realised he was a bit of a long live. Uh, Trevor. Four more visions of loveliness for you. Princess of Wales, Jeff Capes, Alison Halford, and the well-known charity worker, <laughs> Lord Archer. Um, uh, Jeff Capes used to be a policeman. Um, uh, Alison Halford used to be a policeman. A police used to be woman. a policeman? <laughs> I suspect that somewhere in her past, maybe Princess Di had. The only she, person she... who's had nothing at all to do with the police uh, is, is Lord Archer. Didn't she? She dressed up as a policewoman, didn't she, once? Lord Archer is much too fragrant to do anything yeah. like that. Well, I, I think... I mean, I don't want to <laughs> scrounge for a point here. Um, <laughs> you want to scrounge for two points? There's only two are being given to you <laughs> just to sit there. <laughs> All of them have been policemen. Geoffrey Archer actually signed up in the police force, a little-known fact, and spent a, a very short piece of his early career there. Yes, it is Princess Di <laughs> this time, as she's the only one uh, never to have been in the police force. Uh, this is despite getting dressed up as a policewoman in 1986 mm. in order to go to a rave-up party with Fergie. I suppose it's the sort of thing you have to get out of your system before you become queen. <laughs> uh, no doubt uh, it'll be interpreted by Andrew Morton as a sign of suicidal depression, <laughs> going out with Fergie. Uh, <laughs> Alison Halford, Britain's top policewoman, is claiming to have been overlooked for promotion because she's a man, whereas obviously it's got nothing to do with it, it's because she's a Freemason. And uh, Lord Geoffrey Archer... just said, because she's a man. <laughs> Yeah, no, I also said because she's a Freemason. Missed out the knot in both sentences. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Lord Geoffrey Archer joined the Metropolitan Police Force in 1960 when he was 20. Strange then that according to his biographer Jonathan Mantle, Archer denied to the Times Diary in the mid-1980s that he had once been a policeman. Well, his word's good enough for us. Uh, John, a change of mood for you. Geoffrey Archer, <laughs> well-known UN charity worker and non-policeman, Douglas Bader, Edi Armin, and Muttley. Um, uh, Edi Armin wrote The Brothers Karamazov, and uh, Muttley wrote Oliver Twist, <laughs> and Douglas Bader wrote Tale of Two Cities, and the other one can't write. <laughs> Um, no, the, the, the real reason is they've all got medals, except somebody whose name escapes me, <laughs> who just medals. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Lord Archer again, as all the others were decorated with military honours. Uh, oddly enough, uh, Archer is an associate member of the DCM League, which you can only join if you or a close relative hold the Distinguished Conduct Medal. When asked by a League spokesman if his father, William Archer, had won the medal, Archer replied, I rarely talk about my father and his DCM. 
No doubt because his father didn't win the DCM at all. It was, in fact, a completely different William Archer. Perhaps his father was too busy being the British consul in Singapore, as it stated in an interview uh, Geoffrey gave to Guardian journalist Terry Coleman in 1973. Unfortunately, Singapore has never had a consul. Uh, the simple truth is that his father was a local journalist in Western Supermare. <laughs> Still a consul, journalist, Singapore, Western Supermare. It's so easy to <laughs> see how the mistake was made. In case anyone's in interested, uh, cartoon dog Muttley was frequently decorated by his owner Dick Dastardly, or Lord Dastardly, as he probably now is. <laughs> Most dicks seem to become Lord. Uh, <laughs> finally, uh, in this round, Ian, can you bear the suspense? Colin Cowdery. Yeah. John Mortimer. Michael Palin. And Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Lord Archer, the famous charity worker, non-policeman and war hero's son. <laughs> <laughs> That's Colin Cowdery, because he's got a cake on his head. Yes, and because I just Are you identifying you... people who have already been identified? <laughs> Any points for it, that's for sure. All, well, three of these people were undergraduates at Brasenose College, Oxford. The chap on the right hand of the picture... <laughs> um, often says he was at Brasenose College, Oxford. Um, in fact, he was at uh, an institute of education, getting a one-year degree in education and running very fast. <laughs> and he was very old, and he hadn't even got a first degree. It's quite interesting to do a second degree when you haven't got a first degree. And eventually he got into Brasenose as a, a friend of someone's. So... The caretaker. The caretaker. Yeah. <laughs> I should go in for Mastermind on the life of Geoffrey Archer. <laughs> I'd get more questions right than he would. <laughs> yes, the answer is that uh, all of them are graduates of uh, Brasenose College, Oxford, whereas Lord Geoffrey does not have a degree. In fact, he left Wellington School with three O-levels. Uh, curious, then, that in the Sunday Times in 1984, he wrote, Mother was very proud when I got to Oxford. <laughs> she was very upset when I left home after graduating. <laughs> uh, Oxford is not the only university he appears to have graduated from. Apparently, he also has a qualification from Berkeley University in California. But mysteriously, when we rang them up, they had no record of him whatsoever. Lord Whopper of fibbing. <laughs> All of which uh, brings us to the end of uh, this revelatory round. And the uh, current dilemma is that uh, Paul and Trevor have uh, precious little more than 13, and Ian and John go rampaging onwards with 16. <laughs> and so we uh, proudly march in and annex our final missing words round, two batches of absurdly incomplete titles, which our teams will uh, strive to make sense of by completing. Those currently adrift cast off first, so uh, Paul and Trevor stand by. Kinnock puts the blame for election defeat on what? Voters. Um, Bastards, they didn't vote for him. <laughs> Coming <Ooh>. second. <laughs> or rather too honest, really. No, mistrust is actually the word. Uh, princess breaks what during visit? <laughs> <laughs> Into yeah, Ford Cortina. <laughs> No, not as far Breaks as I'm aware. Breaks down during visit. Breaks down, yeah. very good. Poor yes. old die. Poor old thing. Still, think of the civil <laughs> list. Um, <laughs> Bush is... Uh, Bush Lord is... lock of arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Glad you said that. Uh, Bush is caught in what? Threshing machine. <laughs> um, technical technical mm. drawing lesson with prostitutes. <laughs> Big scandal. Uh, Off the shoulder cocktail dress. <laughs> It's, uh, it's a lovely image. Rare episode of Ready, Steady, Go. Yeah. <laughs> almost. Uh, tear gas attack is tear gas actually attack. the answer, uh, but almost there. Yeah. Next, uh, PM tells Argy's what? I can't speak Spanish. <laughs> is it something off? <laughs> Oddly enough, yes. it is. I'll is give it you a point for Keep off. Keep off. Keep off. Yes, is well the right done. answer. And lastly, gummers are old as farmers. What? Toy boy. Uh, <laughs> is, it, is it toy boy? Um... <laughs> It, it could be misconstrued as that. It's actually... Hero. Friend is actually friend. the answer I was looking for. Oh. Rather cute answer. Right. Toy so boys can be friends. True, but not all friends are toy boys. So. No. As no. Jason would tell you. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's got a lot of perfectly good friends. Yeah. He's got nothing to fear in the armed services, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, Ian and John, here are your five. Bad legs force Mrs. Thatcher to miss what? Hip hop competition. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it pig in a passage? Got <laughs> 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 bandy legs. Couldn't stop a pig uh, in a passage. <laughs> Suddenly there's, oh my god, there's a pig loose. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I'll stop it, but it went right through. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh... It's worth it's, two points or it's not. So <laughs> <laughs> it's so close. At least four. It's so close, I'll give you one. Uh, big <laughs> race is a rather disappointing answer after all that. <laughs> uh, next, right, uh, Delore hitches lift home with what still in pocket? Oh. Douglas Hurd. <laughs> Speech. Uh, no. speech is the right answer. You're extraordinary. Speech. Next, uh, Yobbs left me what, says Mella? Pregnant. This job. <laughs> <laughs> ashamed? Uh, extraordinary. Um, so ashamed is um, exactly the right, right answer. <laughs> Next, Germans prefer what to sex? Invading countries. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we all knew that. Is, is it beer? Good no, it's the exchange rate mechanism. Um, <laughs> Drink alcohol. Drink is the right answer. Mm. And finally, royals put on what for birthday parade? Birthday suits. <laughs> <laughs> show of unity. Uh, Fixed smile. I'll give you one for show of unity. Yeah. A united front is actually the answer. So, Which fruitless attempt at quick thinking acts as a fitting end to this brief encounter? And the woeful situation is that this week's flying fish are Paul and Trevor with 23, and this week's pickled herrings are Ian and John with 18. Ooh, So, a five-course banquet for our winners, a box of chicken McNuggets for our losers. <laughs> but uh, falls to me to remind our guests of their contractual obligations vis-a-vis -vis our caption competition. Oh. Ian and John, what do you think of for this? See, she has got bad legs there, look. <laughs> <laughs> they finish abruptly. <laughs> oh, I know what this is. I think, I think she's kneeling down, actually. Paul. She's kneeling down? Yeah. 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 I, I bow to your expert knowledge. <laughs> It's yeah, one of them I saying, I hear the Maxwell brothers have been arrested. <laughs> You're really sorry that we haven't got that story on this week, aren't you? The Maxwell brothers. I wanted Next to do week, my promise. famous Kevin and Ian Maxwell impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, save it. Uh, <laughs> Paul and Trevor, what about yours? Can he ball in his jazz men reform? <laughs> but not with original members? <laughs> Worries about mad cow disease as bovines express interest in brass music? <laughs> <laughs> on, which, uh, on which lovely note, we say uh, thank you to our guests, Ian Hislop and John Sessions, Paul Merton and Trevor MacDonald. And I leave you with news that a stud farm near Reading may have made a remarkable genetic breakthrough. <laughs> Continuing his world tour, Boris Yeltsin arrives in somewhat unconventional manner at Expo 92. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the royal family react to the news that Andrew Morton has been struck by lightning. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Two ends of the political spectrum meet on tomorrow night's show when Cecil Parkinson MP and Norman Willis are the guests. Next tonight, though, Louis goes to Thailand to meet the men who idolise Thai women. <laughs> <laughs>